Kenneth Beerrieger, United States Marine Corps, Korea. Ken served with Weapons Company of the 3rd Battalion of the 1st Marine Division in Korea, and he fought at the Chosen Reservoir and has a very gripping story to tell. He received two Purple Hearts during his actions in Korea for being wounded in action. I was fortunate to interview Kenneth in Omaha, Nebraska, January 14, 2006. It's been a number of years ago. He died seven months after my interview, so we remember him today through this story. And I'd like to thank Brandon Glidden. Brandon, thank you for your support of these Korean War veterans, for helping us tell their stories of what was called the Forgotten War. God bless you, my friend. Okay, folks, if you'd like to sponsor one of these interviews, please contact me. There's information in the video description in the comment section of the video. I would really encourage you to, to consider doing this. Um, don't expect somebody else to do it. There's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears have gone into this work, and I need your help, and I, I thank you for it. All right. Thank you for watching this story. Share it, and uh, just remember to keep this thing going, folks. Freedom is not free. Freedom is earned. And here on the Voices of History channel, that's what our goal is, to educate and to empower people, to become better people, and to be appreciative of the freedoms that they have in this country. God bless you. to 5th Regiment, 3rd Battalion, uh, item company. I was with uh, Weapons Company, 1st Marine Division. 1st Marine Division. And what was your rank during Korea? PFC. And your job title? Was Weapons. Okay. And we had bazookas, demolitions, and flamethrowers. Can you just tell me briefly, without we don't take a lot of time with this question, but why why were we involved in Korea? Uh, to stop communists before it came to our coast, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Japan was under our control, so we didn't want communists in Japan. Mm -hmm. Did North Korea invade South Korea? Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. What, 1950 you went to Korea? Yes. Were you in the Incheon Landing? Uh, Incheon. Did you go in an Incheon or? Wonsan. Wonsan, okay. Okay. I'm really going to take most of my time, um, you know, in and around the Chosen Reservoir. Um, and I've got a few notes that Mark had emailed me, but can you just give me a little bit of... Um, leading up to the Chosen, where you are, where you're going, what your job is as you begin into North Korea there? We landed at Wonsan and headed north. We got our assignments at Wonsan, where we, what company we was going to go to and what was you going to be. And then we headed north as uh, pursuing them to the Yalu border. That was our order, you know, and we'd be home by Christmas. Well, we got as far up it as uh, Kotori, and that's when the Chinese started coming in on us. And we uh, had a nice Thanksgiving dinner on November, and they claimed the Chinese watched us eat our dinner, and then they started coming in. On, well, the other troops got hit before November. But we got uh, surrounded in November, right after Thanksgiving dinner. And I was wounded December 4th on the, on the way out. Well, tell me a little bit about just the first few days as you encounter the Chinese and what's going on. And, and, and give me a little information about the cold and, and just describe what the scene was there. Well, the Chinese would never hit us during the daylight hours because we had uh, close air support. And at night, they would, we would take the top of the ridge or mountain during the daytime hours, and they would want it back at night. And tens of thousands of them would blow bugles or the oriental drums 
or whistles and they would char charge us. And after so many charges, uh, let them have the hill and we'd drop back down to the valley. And they would have it the rest of the night and then the next day we'd take it again. And uh, we started getting our supplies by airdrops and sometimes the Air Force would drop them in the wrong valley and you could see them come out and get our supplies and then Corsairs would come right behind and get them. But there was a, they had all quilt uniforms, but if they was wounded or killed, they'd take their shoes and we had prisoners with the feet twice as big as what they should be. And go to bed some night, not well, go to bed and lay down and the snow would come and, and bury in uh, eight inches of snow. And they say at wind chill index was 60 below, but I suppose the chill was 30, 40 below. Mm -hmm. And we had chew packs and the more you walked, their feet would sweat. And then you get where you wanted to go that night, up the mountain or up the ridge, and your feet would just sweat and freeze in your boots because we had no extra socks. And that's how a lot of, well, and then you could never fire your weapons with gloves on, so you take your gloves off. And that's how those, some of the troops got false bit hands. And I froze my feet. Well, this, uh, you said the Chinese would charge you. I mean, what kind of weapon do you have? We only had bazooka. Well, we had a, I had a carbine mm -hmm. and a 45 mm -hmm. and the bazooka. Uh, I was, at that time, I was only a bazooka ammo carrier. Uh, my sergeant was a, uh, he was a gunner and corporal probably was a loader and a two PFCs was ammo carriers. And we was just fired the bazooka uh, point blank at them because they, they didn't have tanks up there. So walk me through firing a bazooka, what's happening, how you load it, shooting a target, and what you're shooting at again. Walk me through all that. Well, bazooka is probably about six foot long. It broke down into two pieces, about three foot long each. And you hook them together and the gunner would get down hand or whatever on his knees or whatever and a gunner I mean a loader would throw a shell in it must be about 18 inches long and wrap it around the two posts and hit him on the shoulder and say ready and whenever he saw thought he had a target he would fire it and up at the reservoir the targets was all human just fired into them and you know all these some people say after 12 they count, stopped counting on the dead yeah it was night and you just fire and let it go and then in the morning you see how many was out there but you don't know how, what happened and machine gunners they just mowed them down rifle companies but we was attached to this item company wherever they went we went now, were you sighting it in and shooting it? The gunner would, and then he got wounded, and everybody moved up one. And when I got hit, I was loader then. Mm -hmm. And then were they focusing on a person or a tank? Just, uh, well, if there was tanks around, we could never kill a tank. Well, we could not, we could knock the tread off of it. Our 3.5 bazooka was not strong enough to penetrate the uh steel of the tank. So we just knock the track off and then let them go around in circles or call for close air support and they take them out. Or the 75 recordless could take a tank out. But we couldn't take, unless we got them on the, bot, on the belly. But otherwise we couldn't. But we only saw, I only saw one tank over there the whole time I, I was there. Describe the combat camp. I mean, I, um, I've been talking to World War II guys with a lot of the things they did, 
and then I start talking to the Korean veterans, and it just seemed like there was, a, it was almost a different type of war as far as the combat of it. Um, these charges, were they frightening at night? I they mean, scare the hell out of you. And I, and I think that was the number of things. Well, they, I hear there's so many different dialects of the Chinese language that they had to do it by uh, bugles or uh, whistles or something. I don't, we, I don't know. But anybody's come back and says, I wasn't scared, they're lying to you. And another, anybody's over 21 or 22 years old, it wasn't around. The only dumb 18, 7, 8, 18, 19 year olds that didn't have enough, I shouldn't say brains, I mean, they, they was all gun hole. Let's go get them. Somebody worse than that was the British Royal Marines that we had with us. Now they was gung ho. But that I don't know the how, China. How old are you now? I'm right now I'm 73. So you were when I left the states. I was only 17 years old. So in Korea you're 18. I turned uh, 18 in Japan. Yeah. And you guys felt invincible, like nothing oh. could hurt you. Oh yeah, I mean. 17, 18 year olds, I mean, you walk out in front of traffic, you mean, ready to go. But you learn quick. When you hear them bullets going, swoosh, swoosh, then all of a sudden, well, I tell you how invincible we were. Snow and ice and so cold, dig a foxhole. You couldn't dig a foxhole. You put the snow, and then you can't see them. You figured they'll say they can't see you. But that bullet come right through that snow. But you felt safe. So, was it like a baptism under fire, and you just you you realize the reality of war when you start seeing somebody get shot and killed? Well, you go through all this basic training, uh, obstacle courses, and everything, and there are rounds firing over your head in the Marine Corps, but you know, they're not going to kill you in friendly fire and in, in uh, obstacle courses. But when you get over there, it's all for real. And I know, well, two guys didn't believe in the Lord, but over there they became religious. I mean, you see some of your friends and buddies get shot and die. And by the Lord, it could be you. So, like I said, but I wouldn't change a minute of my life. When I came home, I got discharged. Uh, most of my friends, I had to go to service. And I was done with it. I was 20 years old when I got out. Well, almost 20, yeah. Mm -hmm. but. I'm just amazed listening to this. Tell me a little bit more about the cold. I've heard some stories. Was that maybe your worst enemy? I mean, tell me about the, the, we, the food, water, what you ate, what you drank, and all that stuff. Well, the food, I went, uh, I went over wearing probably 165 pounds. Mm -hmm. When I came back to the Great Lakes Hospital, I was down to 145. Uh, the food was uh, sea rations, except our Thanksgiving dinner we had a hot meal. But whenever we did have a hot meal, you go through the line, you had the canteen cup, and if you're going to get uh, cornflakes, well, they put powdered milk in. And by the time you got through the child line, the milk was hot, I mean frozen, and you had to put the canteen over a fire, and you had hot cornflakes. And it was that, I mean, cold. And then sea rations, well, we always had to warm them up. But. Did the food freeze? Oh, yeah. Uh, we, you know, everybody thought we'd buy, be out of there by Christmas, and we didn't have the right clothing. They gave us the shoe packs and parkas. But we had, I had, uh, I had, uh, Long johns, two pairs of pants, mm -hmm. 
Long John's top, uh, T-shirt, uh, shirt. I mean, it just, there was no place to get warm. I mean, it was, once you got cold, you was cold. And you just, you try to stay around a fire, but the fires all had to be put out at night because that was, they could sight in on a fire. So there was no, just what you had on, was that what you're gonna, well then you climb in your sleeping bag and try to get warm. Mm -hmm. But that was every two hours because you had to get up and go on outposts or you had to take your watch. And it got dark at five o'clock at night. And did, you, did you have water? I mean, did you guys drink water? Or melt what? snow. Melt snow in the canteen cup. It's, it's just the, the elements that you had to endure. It just Well, and then after I got wounded, and they tied me to the fender of a six-by-six six truck, mm -hmm. well, now you uh, all the way out on that fender, well, you don't get to eat. I mean, somebody stop by and give you a cigarette or a, this can of sea rations or something, but then he got back to the coast. They called it the Chosen Frozen? Or Cho the, frozen fro the Frozen Chosen? Yep. Uh, and uh, you probably never experienced cold like that since, have you? Oh, well, almost. Yeah. Uh, years ago when we did a Exarbon, that's our, the, it used to be the racetrack here, they did an addition to it, and we worked the winter, mm -hmm. and that Coliseum faces due north, mm -hmm. and that wind blew, and in that Coliseum grandstand, we went into the auditorium or arena where they had ice to get warm. Mm -hmm. So it was almost, but not as quite. Mm -hmm. No, if I ever, well, when I was an electrician, my feet still hurt, burns, mm -hmm. and I had people outside working. Well, I would always use, use the excuse, I gotta go call the office and order some material. Well, it's the only reason, because my feet was cold. But I didn't want to tell them that because then it would, would all follow me in. <laughs> tell me about, do you remember the Tootsie Rolls? Did you guys have Tootsie Rolls or? No, I seen that in one uh, reunion. They said they had Tootsie Rolls, mm -hmm. but uh, we never got any. We had charms mm -hmm. that they gave us but not Tertsy Rolls, we had charms. Tell me about any of the casualties that you saw or were able to help. I mean, were there wounded and people getting killed every day or, I mean, during the Chosen? And on our retreat, on our, no, I shouldn't call it retreat, it was advancing in the opposite direction uh, where the Chinese actually, a uh, whole truck of wounded would kill the driver and then spray the whole body, the back of it. Yeah, we came up on that once, and they just, but we never, they claim we never left the dead behind. Mm -hmm. That had stacked in trucks. Americans, yeah. No, we was going, uh, going up, and it was a Marine from Item Company had to cross this opening and he crossed the opening, and he never knew that he got hit in the end soil. Went right on through, never felt it. And went a while, and then somebody hollered and says, uh, Charlie, you're hit, and leaving, bl leaving blood in the snow. And then all of a sudden, he wanted <laughs> wanted to be vacked out, but <laughs> he, he didn't even feel it. It was so cold. Did you see any men freeze to death or frostbite or anything like seen, that? I've seen Chinese uh, freeze to death. Mm -hmm. They was wounded and they just had to lay there and freeze. Uh, I don't uh, ever remember one of us getting frozen to death. Mm -hmm. But they could have had at the med, uh, vac station where there was... I mean, the medics had to put uh, morphine in their mouth to get it uh, warm enough to shoot into you. 
And then uh, at the med uh, vac station, med station, they would classify you uh, walking wounded, uh, amatory, and air vac out. I mean, they, so, and the ones they could save, they had to just put outside and cover them with straw. And then when we were on the way out, pick them all up and brought them home with us. Now, when you got down to Hung Nang, on the, getting on boats and they reclassify you again and say, you go to Japan, you go to Pusan, and what, where, where to go. Mm -hmm. Tell me about being wounded and what happened to you and where you were and what was going on. Uh, there again at night, they got on top of the hill and I had them company set up five machine guns and had them to rake back and forth and never left an opening, so they thought. Well, they came at us with tens of thousands and some, maybe one machine gun or two of them got out of sync and got an opening and they come through that opening and grenade, concussion grenade. And we all heard it hit five of us behind, uh, on ridge and we heard it hit behind us. And who's going to turn around and throw it back? Well, everybody went down. And when I went down, I knocked my helmet off and I got a piece of shrapnel on my neck. And that's all I remember because they claim it knocked me out. And they took me down to an aid station. Now, 55 years later, now they to Japan and they said they took, took it out and then they shipped me home. But I had to have an MRI at the med center. And the guy says, have you ever had used electric drill? And I said, well, certainly. Do you ever get stuff in your eyes? I said, well, certainly. He says, did they get it all out? I said, oh, I hope they did. Well, he said, we better give you an x-ray of your head. And after he got all done, he says, you know, Ken, you got a piece of shrapnel in your neck, about three-eighths three in the diameter. Mm -hmm. I said, well, Japan was supposed to take that out. You know, maybe they did take a piece out. I don't know. But in 55 years, it's never bothered me. So I don't worry about it. But he says there's still a piece of metal in there. And he says if MRI starts pulling on your neck, let me know. Well, they never did. Because they're only taking it down around the waist. So you guys were going up the hill during the day or down at night, up and down. How uh, long did this go on for? Oh, we got up, like I says, uh, November. I would say Thanksgiving back then was... November 26th, or, you know, I don't remember in 50 when, what date it was. Right. But we did that, we got up to uh, our, oh, so, must have been around the 1st of December, mm -hmm. and I got hit the 4th. And my mom, I bless her soul, she never threw nothing away. And when she passed on, cleaned out the house, I should have brought it. 55-year-old telegram from the service telling her that I was uh, wounded, but no other details or how bad. I would like to have seen that. I mean, I, I, I framed it. Maybe I shouldn't have, but I, she saved it for all those years. I thought I'd better save it. If you think about it, tomorrow... I'm going to be here in the morning. If, if you could drop it off, I could scan it on my computer, and then you can take it right back. So if, if you have time tomorrow morning, I'll be here. Um, well, so you're wounded. Okay. Um, tell me just a bit about the Marines and the camaraderie and the pride of the Marine Corps. Well, the old saying, with the help of God and six Marines, MacArthur returned to the Philippines. And... Once a Marine, I, I mean, always, you know, they say jarhead. Well, say it again and see whose head jars. I mean, it's a fraternity that I truly love. 
And it, everybody that I, well, I, a couple, three Marines that we meet once a, well, uh, about 12 of us meet once a month. And we still win the war every time we meet. And a couple of Marines, I, I meet every week. Uh, when you, this man's de uh, passed on. Mm -hmm. And I think this, I don't know where he's at, if he's passed on or not, but there's two of us still alive. Mm -hmm. and you get to be 55 years ago, home, you just, Mother Nature takes its course. But I, I believe the Marine Corps, we never left, to my knowledge, we never left any <clears throat> wounded or dead behind. Because <clears throat> I, uh, I wasn't that badly wounded, and yet they strapped me to a fender of a truck and brought me out. And you survived, and you came home, and you lived your life. You ever feel guilty for surviving? I mean, you were wounded, but some of the guys have felt a little bit of guilt. Have you ever felt that? Oh, yeah. I mean, why? You could be in the same vicinity, you know, 10, 15 feet or right next to you. But that, that bullet had his name on it, not mine. Why? There's a lot of times at bed at night. Why? Well, I even ask why they take my wife, you know. At, why? Why? And the pastor says, hey, the good Lord's got his, his uh, message and you don't, you don't question it. You wonder why. Were you, a, or are you, or were you a, a praying man, a religious man in Korea? Uh, I, I pray, I use prayers, yes. Uh, when you first got over there and started, then you seen a couple dead. It affect. I mean, you want to go throw up. But after a while, hey, this is a game they're playing. It ain't, you know, it's for real. And you just keep wondering, why me? Why them? Why did I get to stay and they had to go? But. Life do, it does go on. You learn your lessons and... But that, there again, when I ask my granddaughter, what do you know about the Korean War? Huh? Nobody knows about it. And I don't know if uh, Vietnam vets put it out there more than we ever did or we just came home and took our lumps and but we never got a hero's welcome or nothing when we got home so you've been gone and like you said it's a forgotten war and I'm glad you guys have been making it come out now it's time why do you think it's important that we remember about Korea? There's a lot of good men perish that nobody ever knows about. And they have to be told why they perished. We was told we did it because we didn't communists in our country, we stop it at their borders. And I'm a firm believer in that. Maybe that's why they want 17, 18 year old, 19 year old guys to. Mm -hmm. Are you proud, Ken, for your service to our country? I'm very proud of it. I got my, uh, like I said, I got the uh, telegram framed and I got my medals framed. I'm very proud of being a Marine. My car, uh, Chosun Few Reservoir sticker on it, and uh, Semper Fidel, 
the other day, coming home, and this Cox television man followed me. I said, what did I do? I, did I cut him off? But I turned, he turned. I turned in my driveway, he stopped out in front of the house. I got out of the car, he walked up the driveway, he says, I just want to shake your hand. He was a Marine, ex-Marine. Uh, he said, I just want to thank you for what you did. Now, those are few and far between. What, Ken, what does freedom mean to you? Freedom meant that my two sons didn't have to go to the service. Uh, we thought my, I had all my brothers to go to World War II, and they thought they would stop it, and I wouldn't have to go. But I did. I don't regret it. And I thought, I think we did stop them. So, no, I, I think nothing, uh, being proud of the Marine Corps. You saw men that were wounded and killed. Tell me about the price of freedom. What would you tell a young person today that knows nothing about war, about the price that's paid for freedom? Freedom is not cheap by any means. I mean, you, you got to fight for your standard of living. Uh, it just, you're not going to get it free. It's going to take sacrifice. If you're not willing to sacrifice, and then you're not going to get your freedom. And what is the American flight? Tell me about the American flight. What does it mean to you? Uh, it means when I go to the football games or anything and hear the national anthem, all my tears come to my eyes because that's what we fought for. The red is the blood that we fought for. Um, how many years were you in the service? Four. Okay. Do you, do you think about Korea or the war, you know, 55 years ago? Does it seem like it was that long ago, or does it seem like it was just yesterday sometimes? Sometimes, when you, well, I still get to have nightmares. And uh, you wake up and then you find out where you're at, and nobody's there. It kind of scares you sometimes. And, uh, like I said, I'm just proud I, ever, I, I served in the Corps. Are there things in life today that maybe trigger those memories? Well, yeah, there probably is because I'll, I'll get a book about uh, Cho San and I'll read it. And maybe when I go to bed that night, then it's subconscious or something tells you, you know, that article. And then you wake up startled. But I, I still read about it. I got videos about Korea. No, I, I don't know if that makes me uh, gung-ho or just what. But, uh, my one brother gave me a big, it's like, like a rug, but I hung it up on the wall, bring, bring big uh, Marine Corps emblem on it and my date at service and everything. No, I, like I, like I said, I'm a Marine Corps, and always going to be a Corps. Well, I tell you, I'm I'm very thankful for you and for your time and and. Uh... Well, like I, I said, I got had one brother, 33 years in the Navy, from World War II, Korean War, Vietnam, and he actually flew off the carrier not, uh, out of Japan at night, he'd fly over and drop flares for us. 
Now he didn't know I was down there, but he's dropping flurries for us. And our whole family was lucky. Uh, of all the brothers in the Navy and Army, none of them, they all came back in one piece. So I could see a lot of these moms uh, now, even now, but my mom had at one time, I think five in the service. And so she had to have some sleepless nights. I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing that I've asked all the veterans to do, if it's okay with you. Uh, I'm, when I tell you, can you give me a salute into the camera when I tell you to from right there? Okay, Ken, right in the camera. To all your Marines that passed on, God bless you.